Hi everybody and welcome back to this next instalment of my reading of Morris Gleitzman's Boy Overboard. Where we got up to last time, we've met two new characters. Um, we'd met Omar before in the camp. He was the one who was trying to sell water to Jamal and then he stole his ball and then he um, he's the one who fell in the water because there was the dispute over the ball and all of that sort of stuff. So this new character, he's sort of got this kind of, um, he's not a villain, but he's not a good guy either. So he's kind of, it, there's a lot of conflict with, with the emergence of this Omar character. So far, all of the people in the novel have been great, have been lovely people. Yusuf's grandfather was very kind. Yusuf was, was amazing. Mum and dad are heroic. Jamal and Bibi are extraordinary. Um, Bibi can do all sorts of things that girls can't do. And, and there hasn't really been a flawed character yet. And with the emergence of Omar, we have one, which is good. Plus, I guess also you can say I am forgetting about um, the sailor in the yellow overalls. He's a distinct character. And if you remember um, last time, he, you know, he was the one who threw Bibi over the over into the water. He, um, you know, set fire to a to a blanket and then refused to give then refused to give any food to um, Rashida. Who is the one of the other new characters that we've just met, and um, and then he refused to give Jamal and Bibi food as well. Um, Rashida is the next character that we've met. She's a girl. She doesn't wear a burqa. She doesn't cover up. She doesn't wear a headscarf either um, or a hijab. She doesn't wear any of that sort of stuff. She wears makeup. She has green lips, um, and is this brand new character who we're just we're just meeting. You think, oh, and that just shows the depth of complexity that is within the society of people who are fleeing Afghanistan and maybe not just Afghanistan and other countries. Like we know, there are heaps of people who are sitting who are on the deck and sorry, on the dock who had different languages and were speaking different languages and all of that sort of stuff. So I wonder where Rashid is from. I'm sure about to find out some more information about her. So that's where we left off. Um, last week I set a, I set a um, quiz for chapters, I can't remember, gosh, it was like 19 to 23 and that was a mistake. It should have been 19 to 22. So apologies for that mucker. Um, this week you've got from 23 to 25 that you needed to have done before for this one. And now we are reading chapters 26 and we'll see how we go. Chapter 26 is really short, so we probably will get through four chapters today. Okay, are we ready? Let's get into it. We are on page 126 and this is chapter 26. Oh, scrap that. We're on one, page 128. And this is chapter 26. Here we go. You ready? Let's get into it. I hope this works. The sailors haven't stopped me so far, but if things go badly wrong, I'm worried they could turn violent. Luckily, the nasty ones are asleep. The other three are crowded round me, shining their torches, fascinated by what I'm doing. I don't think they've ever seen anyone baking bread on a diesel engine before. I've explained to them as best I can with sign language that usually bread goes inside an oven and that I've made these loaves even flatter than usual so I can drape them over the top of the engine. Also, I want this bread to cook quickly because I've left Bibi up on the deck. Rashid is there, but Bibi will be worried if she wakes up and I'm gone. It's really uncomfortable sleeping, sitting up. You wake up a lot. Please, I have to mind yet again, don't touch it yet. Sailors are almost as impatient with fresh, baked, with fresh baked bread as little sisters. I hope I didn't put in too much salt. It's hard to judge when you're used to the dry stuff. We're in trouble if I mix too much seawater with the fresh water, and kneading the dough in a plastic bucket by moonlight isn't the best way to get the stretchiness right. It's not ready, I mime to the sailors with even bigger hand movements that I hope don't make them cross. It was really good of Rashida to let me use the flour and really smart of her parents to make her bring it in case of emergency. Talking of emergency, this area here under the deck is awash with water. It's up to our knees. I hope the boat isn't leaking. 
I've asked the sailors, but they don't seem to know what I mean. I don't think I'll say anything to Bibby and the others. I don't want to make them anxious. It's hard to digest new baked bread when your stomach's in a knot. That's the end of chapter 26. So what's he doing here? He's 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 channeling his ancestors. He's channeling channeling his father's ancestors who were bakers, if you remember that. And he's baking he's baking bread on the oven cuz on the on the engine cuz it gets really hot. So so he's sort of treating it kind of like a like you kind of, you know, when you if you've ever baked um, flatbreads in a frying pan before which I've done or on a barbecue on a hot plate on a barbecue which we've done before too when you are camping baking flatbread and that's what he's doing and it's so interesting he's just like oh in case of emergencies maybe flour would be really a really good thing to have in your suitcase <laughs> so interesting so good it's a very clever boy is our Jamal imagine what the smell the, the if you know the smell of hot bread Oh, it's so delicious. Oh my goodness. And when you haven't eaten anything, and very clever to mix in seawater as well to get it salty. All right. Page 20, chapter 27, page 130. My stomach's in a knot. You're a genius, Jamal, says Omar, chewing his breakfast piece of bread. I don't feel like a genius. I'm too seasick. <laughs> Omar was right. The waves have got bigger. If only the boat would stop going up up them and then down them if only the seal around us would stop going up and down too bibby clam bibby clambers over me back from giving some bread to the little kids at least she's not seasick that's one good thing the little kids say thank you says bibby and their mum says you're a genius omar drags his fishing line out of the water and examines the bait i could be a genius too if these dumb fish would bite he mutters I think they know this isn't squid. I think they know it's blanket fluff. I groan as the boat moves in several directions at once. Oh, poor thing, says Rashida, putting her hand on my forehead. I read somewhere seasickness is meant to wear off after a day. A week more like, says Omar gloomily. Only five days to go, Jamal. I have a horrible feeling he's right. Half the people on the boat have still got it, some worse than me. All over the deck, people are propped up against each other, groaning. Here, says Rashida, adjusting the spare T-shirt of hers. She's nodded on my head to keep the sun off. Take a sip of water. She lifts a vegetable tin to my lips. I'm, I'm sick too, says Omar indignant, indignantly from under the spare shorts of hers. He's got knotted on his head. Rashida gives him a sip of water too. Bibby gives him a glare. A whiff of vomit and urine hits me and I struggle to keep the water down. For the millionth time since we set sail, I remind myself why we're doing this. Freezing on a hard deck all night, roasting all day, watching poor little children and old people suffer even more than us. Australia. Laughing people. A kind government. Mum and Dad and Dubbo Abattoirs United. Oh, I hope we get there soon. It's really interesting. That's the end of chapter 27. Um, I didn't realize that one was that one was short too. It's really interesting because because the suffering that they're going through um, is is all of this physical suffering and being on a boat. And I just I don't deal with spew at all. I don't cope with it at all as a as a human. If I'm if I'm nauseous and about to spew, then I feel like I'm dying. I'm okay at helping other people. I've got little kids, you know, when they're sick, I can help them. It's no worries. But if it's someone that I don't actually love or care about and they're spewing, oh, oh no, it's terrible. I can't, I can't deal with it. I can't deal with it at all. So the thought of being on a, in the open ocean on a little boat and being that sick when you're not eating very well and, ugh. And the fact that they don't have any cover. So they have nowhere to shelter. So at night time, Oh, hang on. I'll just pause for a sec. Sorry, I had to sneeze. <laughs> Sorry. Um, to think at night time, they don't have a blanket or a tarp or anything to put over them to protect them from night time. And same thing during the day when the sun is glaring straight down on them, they haven't got a blanket or a tarp to put over the top of them. They've just wrapped some of Rashida's clothes around their heads to try and, you know, as a hat. 
And all he's got in his mind is, I've just once we get in Australia, once we get to Australia, it's going to be fine. Let's keep going. Chapter 28, page 132. I wake up. I'm stiff and smelly and sore and hungry, but something feels good. I realise what it is. I'm not seasick anymore. I lift Bibby's head off my shoulder, careful not to wake her, and gently lean it against Rashida's. Then I stand up and painfully stretch my legs and blink gratefully at the sunrise that's turning this flat sea into a golden desert. I realise another thing. The engine has stopped. The silence is blissful after three days and nights of rumbling and chugging. All I can hear is the slap of water against the boat and the faint crying of babies. And suddenly, a smuggler shouting. The three smugglers are standing in front of their cabin with the sailors, with the sailors around them. Noodle soup, I think, happily. They're giving us more noodle soup, except where's the pot? There's been a mistake, shouts the chief smuggler, waving a fistful of boat tickets. The price you were charged is wrong. To go to Australia, you must each pay another hundred dollars. I stare at them, stunned. All over the deck, people are rubbing their eyes sleepily and staring at each other in disbelief. Rashida is on her feet. Bibi, look, still look, st Bibi sits, looking confused, trying to take this in. The chief smuggler says it again in other languages. People start yelling and wailing. A man jumps up and tries to look at the tickets in the smuggler's hand. But a sailor pushes him down and threatens him with a wooden club. I see that all the smugglers and sailors are holding clubs, except the sailor in yellow overalls who's holding a bucket, my bread bucket. Pay the full price, shouts the smuggler, or we turn back. There's a lot of crying now, and it's not just babies. I put my arm around Bibby. The smugglers and the sailors move along the deck, emptying people's bags, thrusting their hands into people's pockets, raising their clubs at anyone who says no. Everything valuable goes into the bucket. Money, jewellery, candlesticks, everything. I can feel Omar trembling beside me. I haven't got anything, he croaks in a tiny voice. Nor have I. My pocket money jar got blown up with my room. I pulled Bibi close to me and wondered desperately how the smugglers would feel about me teaching them $200 worth of ball tricks. I glanced at Omar and Rashida. $400 worth. Not good, probably. Fuel is expensive, the chief smuggler shouts. It's six more days of fuel to Australia. Only three days of fuel to go back. You choose. The bucket appears in front of my face. Pay up, barks the sailor in yellow. Then he recognises Bibi and Rashida. His face twists with dislike. I duck down and fumble under the corner of the blanket and pull out our last two loaves of bread. I put them in the bucket. I hold my breath while the sailor stares at them. I pray he likes sandwiches. The sailor grabs the loaves and flings them into the sea. Before I can offer to make him and the smugglers some fresh bread, if they've got some flour, Rashida reaches into her suitcase and hands something to the chief smuggler. It's a watch. Four people, she says. The smuggler studies the watch, then tosses it into the bucket. We all wait for him to say it's not enough. The sailor smirks. Omar prays. Rashida bites her lip. I hang onto Bibi. Ever since the bread hit the water, she's been growling and trying to get close enough to kick the sailor. The smuggler moves on, pulling the startled sailor after him. We stand here, weak, with relief. When we find the strength to speak, Omar gets in first. Where did you get a watch that valuable? He asks Rashida. Dad bought it with the rest of his savings, she, she replies. He knew this would happen. I want to hug Rashida. I also want to hug her dad. Instead, we sit here, hoping the smugglers get enough in their bucket. Finally, they do. The boat engine coughs into life and we jolt forward and chug and rumble towards Australia again. I want to hug Rashida and her dad even more. Instead, I stare at the horizon, hoping desperately that if the same thing happens on mum and dad's boat, mum gives up her wedding ring without a fight. That sailor in the yellow overalls. <sighs> the only thing of value that they had, the only thing that they have that they have to offer, 
and what is valuable to them and means means that they'll have the comfort of at least a full belly and a, you know a little bit of energy to help them through the next few days he threw into the ocean it's heartbreaking it's just heartbreaking that he would do something so callous and cruel when it was all that they they had to offer because it was worthless to him it what it wasn't value it wasn't us dollars my god all right here we go chapter 29 let's move on page 136 jamal whispers bibi how many days have we been on this boat her head is heavy against my arm i open my eyes the sunlight sears in i squint down at her face it's wet with perspiration she's got a fever how many days she whispers again i wipe her face with rashida's spare t-shirt five i say i think Six, murmurs Rashida, sitting hunched on the other side of me. I was going to say that, mutters Omar, over her shoulder. I know why Bibi's asking. The food and water on the boat ran out this morning and she's wondering how many days left till we get to Australia, trying to work out if we can survive. I've been doing the same. The answer's three, and I don't know if we can. A lot of people sitting on this deck look as though they feel the same way. I've never seen so much despair on so many faces. I wipe Bibi's face again. Try to forget which day it is, I say to her. Just, just try and rest. I don't want to forget which day it is, says Bibi, in a tiny voice. It's my birthday. I stare at her, my son addled brain frantically calculating the date. She's right. Oh, Bibi, I say. I'm sorry. How could I have forgotten? It's bad enough being stuck out here in the middle of the ocean on your birthday, but to have your own family forget is terrible. I can see from Rashida and Omar's faces that they think so too. Happy birthday, Bibi, I say to her miserably. The others do too. Then I pull myself together. There's not much I can give Bibi for her birthday out here, not even a glass of water. But one thing I can do is try and cheer her up. Well, let's plan a party for your birthday, I say to her. We'll have it when we get to Australia. Okay, she says, brightening. My birthday's in four months, says Omar. Rashida gives him a dig with her elbow. In Australia, I say to Bibi, when it's your birthday, the Australian government comes round to your house with a cake and fizzy drinks. I'm not completely sure if this is true, but with a kind and caring government, it could be. Anyway, it's the thought that counts. And sardines, says Omar. Yes, I say, probably. And hamburgers with onion and egg and chilli sauce, says Rashida. Oh, definitely, I say. Brilliant, says Omar. What's a hamburger? Rashida tells him. I prefer ice cream to hamburgers, says Bibi. She's looking better than she has for hours. In Australian supermarkets, I say, they sell 50 different kinds of ice cream. Okay, I'm getting carried away now. The others look at me frowning. 50, says Omar. Get real, says Bibi. 20, maybe. I give them a look to let them know that if I'm exaggerating a bit, it's to make us all feel better. What's a supermarket, says Omar. Rashida thinks for a moment. It doesn't have stalls like a normal market, she says. It's, a, it's one very big shop. That sells everything. Even bait? Says Omar gloomily, eyeing his fishing line. Bait and everything, says Rashida. My mum used to love supermarkets. Your mum? I say, staring at her. Didn't I tell you? Says Rashida. I was born in Australia. Now Bibi and Omar are staring at her too. Soon after I was born, we had a letter from Afghanistan, says Rashida quietly, telling us how all my uncles were dead in the war. So we went back to look after my grandparents until they died too. And then the government wouldn't let us return to Australia. My parents are very sad. Rashida stares out across the churning water towards where we've come from. Then she turns away and pulls out her mirror and lipstick. I watch her make her lips green again, which can't be easy when the boat's rocking and your lips are trembling. Sorry about your uncles and your grandparents, I say quietly. And your parents. 
Before I can stop myself, I'm thinking about my uncles and grandparents and mum and dad. And suddenly, Phoebe's birthday doesn't feel so happy anymore. Oh. So, the mystery the mystery of who Rashida is and what it all means and where she comes from is revealed. So if she was born in Afghanistan, uh, if she was born in Australia to Afghani parents and they're not allowed back and she's not allowed back, they mustn't be, they mustn't be citizens. So they mustn't have been what we call naturalized or gone through and, and um, be, you know, made citizens of Australia. So she mustn't have, an Australian passport. She might only have an Afghani passport or had a, an Afghani passport, but that explains why she, so she's grown up in Australia and that, that explains, that explains why she's, that explains why she's um, not covering up and wearing makeup and all of that sort of stuff, which is really interesting. Okay. We're going to leave it there for now. Um, we've got, you see that we've got this much to go of the book, which isn't, which isn't, which isn't a lot. We'll probably finish it on the other side of the holidays. Um, we'll give it one last, one last push and, and we'll see how we go. So it's pretty grim for them. They've still got three days to go before they get anywhere and they've run out of food and water. And what do we, what do we know about survival? You can, su it's, it's the rule of three, isn't it? You can survive three minutes without air three days without water and three weeks without food. So if you have, so the three week thing, if you have water, you'll, it'll take you three weeks to starve to death. If you don't have water and you don't have food, you'll, you will die. Your internal organs will shut down in three days. And they're saying that they've got three days to go and they don't have any food or water and they're desperately thirsty. I get the sense that they're desperately thirsty. Anyway, I'm inferring that for sure. Poor Bibi having a birthday on the boat. It's really sad. It's, a, it's really sad for her to have that situation. Oh, we're so close to finishing. I'm quite amazed. All right, that'll do for now. Um, make sure you're taking notes. Make sure you're thinking about the essay question that you are going to be responding to. Have a go at doing the doing the quiz from last week's reading. And remember, if you're not too sure, you've got to get an 80% to pass. You've got to get 8 out of 10 to prove that you have read the chapters that have been prescribed or watch this video. And don't forget, you can always go back and watch it again and get the information that you need. Um, by watching the videos as many times as you like, that's which is totally fine too. And a lot of people have been doing that. You can tell by the numbers of people who are watching. There are way more, way more views than the, than there are students. So, so that's really good. That's really positive. All right. Thank you, everybody. Bye.